today's uh, afternoon session. So our first speaker is going to be Saeed Rascu, who will tell us about the problem of time in quantum cosmology with a quantum clock. No, okay, great. So, yeah, so this is a work with uh, Rodolfo Gambini in collaboration with Rodolfo Gambini and my PhD student, Jordan Roberts. Uh, the title is a little bit misleading, so you will, you will see why. Um, so, I'll talk about the problem of time in general, conditional probabilities, and our model, and finally the result, which is in, under construction. So, you have heard about problem of time during the conference. Uh, but let me just give you a reminder of what it is. The fastest way to see this is in the classical uh, uh, regime is we have in theories of nature, especially fundamental interactions, we have this relation between canonical variables uh, which are bound to be equal to zero. And these are called constraints. A class of these constraints are called first class constraints. And those are the ones that generate gauge transformations in the sense that if you choose a, oops, if you choose a, any function of the phase space f, and you put them, put that in Poisson bracket with this constraint, you get something delta f, and that's the gauge transformation of f under this first class constraint. Now, all good until now. Now we can also define Dirac observables, which are naturally observables are things that don't change under gauge transformations. So we have change, a gauge transformation of these observables. These are defined by they, their gauge transformation being equal to zero. So that means that their Poisson bracket with the first class constraint is zero. Everything until now uh, uh, looks nice. Now the problem arises here. So the Hamiltonian of the full gravity, or the full gravity plus matter, is a constraint or combination of cons first class constraints. So when you want to compute the time derivative of Dirac observables, so these are observables, it means that that's the normal way of computing the the time derivative or evolution, it turns out because of their, by definition, their um, time evolution, because this is a first class constraint, is their gauge transformation. So time evolution is just gauge transformation. It's not physical. In other words, it's just zero. So all the constants, all the observables, Dirac observables are constants of motion. So everything is frozen. That's called the problem of time. This is the, the easiest way to see that. In the quantum regime, um, all the as physical state should be destroyed by all the first class constraints. Hamiltonian is the first class constraint. It should destroy the states. This means that you, get, you don't get a Schrodinger equation, which on the right hand side you get this time evolution. You only get zero, so it means that again, you have a frozen framework for, for your system. So this is the sense of uh, a problem of time. Now, how you solve this, there are several ways to do that. There's a very nice uh, review by Kukash. 2011. Uh, the one I like and I'm working on is the conditional probability interpretation. And what it, it tells you is that, suppose that, so bas basically I can ask probabilistic questions. And suppose that I create or, or um, basically construct a variable called t, I call it clock, out of canonical variables. I construct another variable, q. This is the system or what I want to find its evolution with respect to this clock variable. I construct that one too. And then I ask the question, what is the, con what is the probability of q taking value q naught given that t has already taken the value t naught? So this is the conditional probability. And it is written as the joint probability of, of p q naught and t naught divided by the probability of t naught. Okay, so uh, if you it is a classical version. In the quantum version, what you do is that you have a Hilbert space of clock, the cross product, the cross product Hilbert space of clock and the, the other variable, and you construct these projection operators. Well, so you have a density operator for your system. You construct these project projection operators, for example, for t for clock being equal to t naught, uh, and you also construct another one for for q. And then you ask the question, so if I act this on my basically state, if the answer of the, if the action gives you the, the condition that yes, the eigenvalue of t is t naught, then you go to the next step and say that, okay, now is the eigenvalue of q is equal to q naught, and if the, that answer is yes, then you get something non-vanishing and it gives you a probability divided by this. System. So that works in, based on these projections. 
okay, so um, this thing people in, uh, you know, in quantum mechanics like to write it in, in another way. They just use the property of, of projection operators, you write it like that, and finally, they use, this is very important, they use the fact that these projection operators in their formulation commute, and then they write this, they, because they lock this part, they call this uh, the, the, a new sort of density operator, they call it, um, well, they have different names, but you see that this there for them is important. But this is a condition where uh, operators corresponding to Q and T commute, so they basically don't interact, right? We are going to not consider that because we are going to consider clocks that are interacting with the system. Okay, so the Page and Wouters, first 1983, they used this method to, to answer, you know, some, basically to answer the problem of time. So we don't have evolution with respect to small t, but we have evolution in this way, uh, with respect to real, uh, realistic clocks. Okay, so what goes wrong in their formulation? They get the wrong propagator, actually Kuka shows, showed that. The wrong, wrong propagator for the single particle system or single particle state. This basically means that the particle is not moving in time or space, which it should be like this, but they get it like that. So that's a problem. Another thing is that for them, because they construct these clocks and variables out of usually, I mean, in the sense that non-Dirac observables, uh, so these don't commute with your Hamiltonian, so the action of them just throws you out of the constraint surface, so you have a problem with that too. Now, we're going to solve these problems in our framework in one go with two new assumptions. Um, so this is the modified version. So it started 2001 basically and 2009, and now we are improving it this year. Um, the, one of the improvement on this is that we use evolving constants of motion instead of uh, whatever Page and Wouters use, like the spin and other stuff. So evolving constants of motion are basically Dirac observables, which are parameterized by that small t that you saw in, like we call it time. Uh, that's called, that's the weird name, evolving constant, because they're actually constants. They don't, their gauge transformation is zero, but they kind of move because they have a t in them. Um, this is what we have actually in our new work. Uh, we now consider interacting clock and clock and the, and the system, and that means that they don't commute. So because I have five minutes, I have to go faster. So it means that now our probability, first of all, it has an, uh, wait, okay. So it has an integral over dt because these are now evolving constants of motion. This projector correspond to evolving constant. They have t in them. But we don't know where does that capital T becomes equal to T, capital T naught. So we have to integrate over the whole range of this experiment, basically what you're doing, and uh, then ask this question that you saw. So what, if uh, T takes the value of T naught, does the system has Q equal to Q naught? Uh, and the numerator is now different from all previous works because these don't commute, but uh, so these, these, these two new things uh, remedy the problems of the page Wouters uh, system. So I'm going to quickly go through our model. This is a cosmological model with uh, two uh, scalar fields. The Hamiltonian constraint, which is a constraint, becomes like that. And these are uh, the canonical variables in the gravitational sector related to the scale factor. And this is the momentum of the scalar field. And uh, so first step, you find the Dirac observables immediately based on equations of motion, you see that P phi commutes with the Hamiltonian, which is a, the only first class constraint in the system. So this P phi, P phi one and P phi two are, are Dirac observables. Out of those, I can, I'm gonna, so we can uh, uh, create a nice uh, four dimensional phase space based on these observables. And then we identify a combination of the uh, phase space with that T. And then we go on and construct two evolving constants of motion, as you see these both of these commute with the Hamiltonian, but they have T in them. Well, here you see these. And that's why they're called evolving constants of motion. And so then you go on and quantize. So for now, we are doing just a Schrodinger representation, no loopy stuff, no nothing, because it's already very complicated. The self-adjointness is very important because, remember, we want observables. If they are not self-adjoint, they are not observable. Even if you don't look for observables, if they are not self-adjoint, you will have problem with defining probabilities. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pass. So the, the way we, we assure that these are self-adjoint is via deficiency indices, which I don't talk about because there's no time. 
maybe if there are questions at the end. So um, now what the probability. So what we do is that our clock, so this thing, has discrete uh, uh, eigenvalues. We chose it like that. However, the other variable, E2, which we want to compare with respect to clock, uh, previously it was called Q. Now it's called E2. Um, this is, it has continuous spectrum, so we look in, so basically we are looking if E2 goes from E2 1, which is the central value of E2 minus some delta, small delta E2 to plus delta E2, basically. The, for the density operator, we choose a pure state, but you see these, uh, these uh, uh, heavy side functions, these two limit the system where O1 and O2, so this is a function of O1 and O2, this is between O11 and O22. So basically, in the phase space, you have a basically, a, a, in configuration space, you have a box, and you put your, your state in that box. This is an idealization, of course. And uh, so at the end, what happens is that you can compute the denominator as that you saw before, this denominator. You can, for now, we can compute it exactly. However, the numerator is a, is a, is a tricky ob object. Well, it's still under construction, and we hope that we can compute it exactly. For the moment, we did certain approximations. So basically, to understand what's the problem, we have these integrals of exponentials of tangent hyperbolic inverse of sine and cosine, something like that. So we have to go on and, and compute those integrals exactly. Anyway, so this is a very prelim preliminary uh, result. And so this, this is E2, this is time, the, the clock, and this is the probability. So as you see, the probability is kind of peaked around some values, and as time goes on, this value of E2 goes to the right. So this is the approximation in the classical regime, basically, we could do it in that, and basically uh, matches with the cosmology. So the volume of the universe is changing and increasing with, with this clock. Now, if we, we can do the integrals exactly and correctly, we will see more, uh, more stuff close to where the, the, the quantum regime is strong. And then the next step is basically to go on and do the either polymer quantization or loop quantization. So I'll summarize. Uh, so for a solution to the problem of time, one of the best ones, in my opinion, is the conditional probability. And uh, um, what we construct is now free uh, of those issues that Page and Wouters proposed almost 40 years ago. And this is realistic because our system and clock are both quantum, both observable, and both I mean, interact with each other. So this part, especially of interaction, was not present in any of the previous works. And uh, so this model also, I didn't talk about this, obviously, because of the time, but incorporates collapse, uh, kind of the, an explanation also for the collapse due to decoherence. Um, so it has other, other ramifications. And so the paper comes out soon, hopefully, in a, in a month. And so yeah, so thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you, Said. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Actually, I had one about your second point. Uh, maybe you went a bit fast. So uh, you didn't explain why, how y you got the right propagator, let's say. Yeah, did I didn't explain uh, it, but the, the, the point <laughs> actually is that the reason you get the right propagator is that you use observables or, or evolving constants of motion as for your Qs and Ts for your projectors. Page and Butters didn't do that. They just took something we call uh, partial observables in, in this context. So they are not Dirac observables, and that's why they didn't get the correct result. Oh, okay, 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 thanks. Yes. Uh Yeah, I had a related question. The, uh, the plot you showed, um, is it correct with respect to semi classical limit? Instead of checking the propagator, you could check that the speed of this wave packet is what you would expect classically. The plot? The plot? Yeah, you said it's moving to the right. Yes. So is the speed consistent with the classical equations? Yes, so we, okay. we, what we did was we, in the classical regime, we computed, so we have a, a, a formula, we have a formula for E2 as a function of a small t and E1 as a function of a small t, you eliminate t between them and you find the classical E2 as a, fu as a, as a function of E1. Compared to this, in the very classical regime, they actually match. So this is that regime. Yes. 
best approximation this is actually. Okay, good. So I think uh, we have to move on. Let's thank Said again.